The Disappearance of Women Destroying Eve is the best revenge against God Would you believe that the disappearance of women is a project as old as humanity itself? In Canto 9 of Paradise Lost, John Milton describes with lyrical beauty how the angel Lucifer, or Satan, who has just been expelled from the heavens, falls to earth and, beholding the incomparable beauty of Eve in the garden, decides to avenge his failure on her. Satan is furious because he cannot dethrone God, but he senses that by destroying Eve, he will destroy the most beautiful in God's order and creation. So destroying Eve is the best revenge on God. This is Satan's first temptation when he sees Eve walking in the Garden of Eden, rabid and vengeful jealousy against Eve, who was perfect and innocent when he, the serpent, first approached her. We can indeed read human history as Satan's effort to destroy God's perfect plan. The serpent understands that the best way to hurt God is to destroy, corrupt, and defile Eve, the most beautiful creature in his creation. And thus begins the whole tragic story of our paradise lost. The agenda to destroy Eve is today in the hands of the forces of transgenderism, the LGBTQAI groups that aim to erase and redefine what a woman is until she is wiped off the map. There is a young woman called Helena on YouTube, I'll leave the link in the notes, who went through four of the thousand genders that LGBTQIA ideology tells us exist from girl to demigirl, and from demigirl to demiboy, from demiboy to gender fluid, and finally to trans boy. Now 23, Helena says that she regrets transitioning as a teenager. Her story is highly revealing. This beautiful woman, now recovered because she has detransitioned, tells us on screen what was the chain of thought that led her to make such a regrettable attempt against herself. Simply, she did not want to be normal, i.e. binary or cis, because in her school, contaminated also by critical race theory, I suppose, she was taught that if you are an ordinary girl, you are boring, privileged, oppressive, and evil. Those are the terms she uses. So to stop being ordinary, boring, privileged, oppressive, and evil, Helena agreed to undergo the genetic and social experiment of trying to change her gender. Helena is a beautiful woman. Nothing was wrong with her body, her physical attractiveness, or her sexuality. But she was miserably tricked into feeling that if she blocked her puberty, if she ingested testosterone, if she mutilated her breasts— she would be the coolest and happiest girl. She would stop being the typical, boring, privileged, oppressive, bad, white girl that she was. Cheer up, Helena. Surgery and tons of hormones will bring immediate clarity and solve your identity and your life. This is as criminal as suggesting to anyone, Hey, why don't you cut off your head? And then you'll never have any migraines or toothache again. Come on, don't be afraid. Helena sadly will be a beautiful woman scarred for the rest of her days. Because the serpent bit her. Because this is how women are destroyed today with the help and advice of science. There are people online telling teenagers that this awkwardness and self-doubt, which all humans suffer from during adolescence, but even many animal species do too, is evidence of gender dysphoria. You don't like the way you look? Gender dysphoria. You don't like how people around you perceive you? You're dysphoric. You don't like the way your clothes fit? Unmistakable proof that you're dysphoric. 
you don't like how your body is developing and changing or how your voice sounds. And even as adults, we suffer from these same insecurities all the time, I promise you. All this is clear evidence of gender dysphoria, and we can solve it forever with hormones and surgeries. Whoever recommends this is immorally exploiting that insecurity we all go through as teenagers to encourage us to make changes and decisions that will leave us stranded on the wrong side of the river of life for the rest of our days. This is the serpent executing his vengeance against God. Can you imagine the loneliness, depression, and cosmic shame of discovering years or months later that you made the most serious and irreparable mistake ever possible against yourself when you did not yet have the maturity or the information because nobody has it because there is no information to ruin your life forever? Do you realize how brave and admirable Helena is to stand before the cameras today and tell us about the cosmic mistake she made with the dream of saving the lives of other girls like her before they, too, make such a mistake? Bravo, Helena. I'm your fan. If you already put yourself through gender surgery, know that all those immoral doctors and counselors who took you down that destructive path, did not have enough information about the cost and consequences of irreparably mutilating your body. That information no one has, because there isn't any. We have never been here. How can these criminals pretend to know what they are doing when we have never been here? The scientific claims of transgenderism and all these criminal surgeons, these butchers of medicine, are as ridiculous as those of a cheat trying to sell you a tourist guide to the planet Neptune, when no one has ever been there. These shameless surgeons use their patients as the guinea pig in which to learn and make all the mistakes on the way to creating a great new source of income for themselves. Because once you undergo their surgery, you become the perpetual client of their services, their source of passive income, the slave, the indentured person that will serve them and make them rich for the rest of their days. And yours, which will be far fewer days than the days you would have lived had you kept your body whole and healthy. Wake up. The snake wants to bite you. Now, you and I imagine that there will surely be someone helping and advising these millions of boys and girls through this fateful and defining time that is adolescence, especially in decisions as complex and critical for their present and future as undergoing gender denial surgery. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Did I say gender denial surgery? Whoops. Of course, I meant gender reassignment surgery. But the snake is the most wounded and relentless creature and wants no one to help these boys and girls. By the most perverse and corrupt directive from the most perverse men and women in charge, clinical psychology professionals in countries like Canada and the USA today have no right to advise any girl or boy who come forward to ask for gender denial. Oh, sorry. I meant gender reassignment. In such civilized and wealthy nations like Canada and the USA, a clinical psychologist who even attempts to talk to this child to help them clear their mind before they take an irrevocable step, to help them consider whether they may be rushing at their very young age to make a decision that they will never be able to remedy. The professionals whose mission and training is to help children not to make a catastrophic and irrevocable mistake are legally gagged by pressure from transgender LGBTQAI groups. 
The serpent does not want or tolerate anyone being rescued. The serpent wants her revenge against God. And this is why those professionals who should help these girls and boys not to gamble their future happiness and fulfillment so cheaply are now obliged, on pain of professional disqualification, on pain of losing their professional license, to prescribe immediately and without question testosterone treatments, puberty blockers, and irreversible surgeries such as mastectomy for girls and castration for boys. And so, psychologists and medical professionals, to their eternal shame, actively contribute, under the pressure and with the applause of LGBTQAI groups, to the war on women, to the disappearance of women. And men, of course. Oh, <laughs> the snake is happy. The LGBTQ, the, I'm going to have to say that again. The LGBTQAI, was that? Yeah, no, yeah. LGBTQAI, yeah. The LGBTQAI agenda, that is, the transgender agenda, aims to make women disappear from medical and legal language. And you can imagine that any person or entity that does not appear in medical or legal records is non-existent. It is an entity or person that has vanished. It is an entity without rights, because how can you ever claim anything if you don't appear or exist in any record? Ask yourself, who would benefit from the disappearance of women? Certainly not women, nor men. But LGBTQAI groups think they would. Incredibly, shockingly, only last year, in mid-2022, a nation as beautiful and admirable as Ireland, a country that has given the world titans of culture, of the stature of St. Patrick, James Joyce, Samuel Beckett, Oscar Wilde, William Butler Yeats, Seamus Heaney, and you too, promoted a document that sought to strengthen equality in the workplace. And to achieve this, to strengthen equality in the workplace, it eliminated women by systematically removing the words woman, female, mother, and daughter, as if these were shameful or discriminatory terms. While, at the same time, it established the privilege of trans men to take maternity leave to breastfeed their babies. What? In other words, only those women who so abhorred being women that they went into the labyrinth of trying unsuccessfully every day for the rest of their lives to become men, but because they are really and naturally women, were able to miraculously give birth, only they have the right to take a break in the working day to breastfeed their babies. So only those who loathe being a woman deserve a woman's rights. Really? And thanks to having trusted leaders like Nicola Sturgeon, another nation as beautiful and admirable as Scotland, also went to the very brink, and even more frantically, thanks to Nicola, down the same road to death, feeling immensely proud and very modern and inclusive in doing so. Goodbye, Nicola. Enjoy your retirement. No one's going to miss you. Let me dig a little deeper. The Irish document aims to remove all mention of women from maternity laws and acts. Imagine a bill that replaces the words women, mother, and girl in all clauses on childbirth and breastfeeding. Imagine in a birth certificate you cannot use the words mother or girl because these terms offend and exclude transgender persons as if they were ever planning to have children. So a doctor or official cannot write or say something like the name of the mother of the baby girl who was born is because that is cruel and discriminatory, cry LGBTQAI groups. 
So we all have to say something as tortuous and devious as the name of the person who gave birth to the person with a womb and a vagina is... Mm. Wow. Not even George Orwell could come up with something so mean and twisted in the darkest moments of his novel, 1984. Ah, but women offend trans men, who we know are women who hate being women. So the LGBTQAI agenda under whose influence and directives such criminal laws and bills as this one are drafted wants to make women disappear. Because their presence is offensive and inconvenient? I'm sure the snake is delighted. We are where we are because we have corrupt politicians and leaders constantly betraying us. Like Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland, who thankfully resigned after being caught, ridiculed and denounced time after time for her egregious contradictions and lack of integrity on the transgender issue, which she tried to impose on Scotland without consulting anyone, apart from LGBTQAI groups, of course. Scotland, by the way, is now, today, the place least friendly to the idea of gender choice and reassignment. There you go. Bravo. But what of so many dishonest feminists, such as the new Justice Ketanji Brown, promoted to the U.S. Supreme Court by President Biden? A woman who now has the power to adjudicate, proclaim, and explain the law to an entire intelligent and powerful nation does not know, or rather, does not have the integrity to say what a woman is. Oh, there's that discriminatory term again, woman. Ketanji Brown publicly claims not to know what mysterious thing a woman is because she's not a biologist to know. Don't ever ask her what car she drives because she's not a mechanic to know. How low we have fallen. There is a baffling and disturbing documentary in which a film producer named Matt Walsh goes around American universities and institutions asking a hundred men and women, what is a woman? The answers and evasions he receives are dark, devious, and extremely disturbing for the cause of women. Don't miss it. It's free on YouTube. I leave you the link in the notes. Jane K. Rowling, the brilliant creator of Harry Potter and the Extraordinary Beasts series, has been disowned, insulted, and blocked by transgender forces for refusing to accept that a woman should be identified as a menstruating person, a person with a vulva. How? We ask. Why? Why would a woman not just be called a woman and should instead be called such things? A person with a vulva, a person with a cervix. Because transitionists would be offended if, after so much effort to become men, they were to be declared women in some document on some unforeseeable remote day when they might give birth. Because they could, because they're women, right? No, hold it. But now they identify as men, so they're men, but uh, as men they could become mothers. I'm very confused. All hospitals and maternity wards must be cleansed of prejudiced terms like women. Because one day, for some strange and frankly unimaginable reason, transgenders may be there to give birth. And what an insult it would be to be called women. So now, to avoid offending their delicate sensibilities without meaning to, we must all abandon the use of words that identify women as women. Makes all the sense in the world, doesn't it? Do you realize how irrational and narcissistic transgender ideology is? 
because they would be offended if they were called women. Now, no one can use the term woman or mother, but should instead use a petty, reductionist, demeaning terms like menstruating people, people with a cervix, with a vulva, with breasts, people who give birth. The most arrogant and self-serving minority in the population, one in every 10,000 people at most, decides what the whole population can or cannot say. A single, whimsical little voice, one in 10,000 people at most, imposes on 9,999 people what language must be used. Doesn't that seem a little, a little bit narcissistic? Look, according to figures from the UK Parliament, there were 14.6 million people in the UK alone with some form of disability in the year 2020-21. This represents 22% of the total population of the UK. 22% of the total population of the UK. To go into more detail, 9% of children, 21% of working age adults, and 42% of adults above state pension age were disabled in some way or another in 2020-21. These are people, children, adults, and the elderly, who beyond any psychological or emotional conflicts they may have, as transgender people do, also suffer from medically proven deficits in mobility, physical energy, or severe breathing problems, depression, and mental health. And there are equally vast numbers of minorities worthy of immediate attention, such as patients awaiting transplants or life-saving treatment, political refugees, single mothers, autistic children who require and deserve special education, Babies with genetic deficiencies that drastically limit their life expectancy. And a thousand others. But the minority in most urgent need of help and attention are the people lost in the labyrinth of transgenderism. They are the ones who should dictate social and educational policies and receive the most attention and the bigger slice of the budgets of businesses and public institutions clownish gestures of support from the British police, painting police cars with the colors of the rainbow. Oh, trouble, danger, crime, don't worry. Here comes the rainbow car (laughs) to help you. Businesses like Sainsbury's, institutions like the Mosley Hospital in London, flying proudly the rainbow flag. I don't understand why. One in 22 people in the UK has a proven medical disability, one in nine children among them. But the one in 10,000 who say they were born in the wrong body are the ones we should urgently look after. Is their case the most urgent, the most important, the most worthy? If we accept the dictates of the transgender, we will be accepting and promoting the disappearance of women from language and ideas. Because transgenderism wants everything that naturally distinguishes us to be diluted and erased until all that exists is them who claim to be in perpetual fluidity. Only the sea is in perpetual fluidity. Ask the mountains to stop being mountains and become fluid like the sea. And you'll see what a flat, thin, muddy world you end up with. Who would think of making women disappear? The snake. Women menstruate only once a month and between the ages of 12 and 50, roughly. If we describe them as menstruating persons, we make them disappear for the rest of the month and the rest of their lives. What are women the rest of that month? What are women the rest of their days once they stop menstruating? Transgenderism wants to appear intelligent and worthy of attention by reducing women to a biological period of five or six days a month when they menstruate. And what are women the rest of the month? 
people waiting for their identity to be fulfilled or validated this month? Floating entities without name, grace, or gender who walk around in the dark waiting for their moment of existential manifestation, which is only that moment when they menstruate. Women only menstruate five or six days each month and for only 20 or 25 years of their lives at most. Is that all that defines a woman? You see how right J.K. Rowling was to refuse to buy this. By this logic, if a woman were to stop menstruating for some medical reason, she would cease to exist. Do you see? <laughs> the snake is having a party. But transgenderism and the volubility of LGBTQAI ideology have appeared on the ground already tilled and fertilized by feminism. Mm. <laughs> now I'm really making friends. Feminism has done everything to destroy the differences between masculine and feminine. Feminism at its core craves the power of the male. They insist on arming women to compete on the battlefield of the masculine, denigrating anything that is truly radically feminine, such as pregnancy and motherhood, and thus sowing and fertilizing the ground for the disappearance of women. For the last 60 or 70 years, we men have been under daily and relentless attack from feminist ideology. Now, Oh, bitter awakening, it is the turn of women, because by erasing the lines of the masculine, gender ideology erases at the same time and equally the lines of the feminine. If you take away from yin, you take away in the same measure from yang. And down goes equilibrium, the balance and complementarity of the opposites. And we are all left stunted and dull, like withered flowers in the middle of our journey. Oh, the snake is so happy. Her revenge against God is on a roll. The greatest virtue and power that women have ever had and will ever have is the divine and cosmic virtue of giving life of being the only ones capable of bringing new human beings into this world. Sadly, and this will make many women I love and respect jump, feminism has sold three generations so far the lie that to be feminine is to be weak and rather pointless. Feminism has, for seven decades, eroded womanhood by discrediting and even ridiculing motherhood. Feminism, founded and propped up, interestingly, by women who never had children, proclaimed the idea that motherhood is a nuisance, an obstacle to the fulfillment of modern women, and that it is much better for them to be slaves to office jobs, as we men have always been, with the illusion of achieving success in business and finance. An illusion that we men have always had, because that is the only way we are considered winners. Feminism sold women the male version of the theater of life and with it the miseries, anguish, and anger that only men used to experience in the workplace. Feminism robbed countless millions of women of the cosmic privilege and joy of being mothers and bringing life into their own lives and to the world. Nothing a woman does or achieves will ever be as high, unique, and extraordinary as a baby. Feminism corrupted the minds and hearts of women every time it convinced them that being mothers was unworthy of them, that they should put it off, that the best expression of their lives and talents would be found in competing with men as men in their world and sphere of men. Because feminism first convinced them that the only true and most desirable world was that of men. Because for feminism, the most important thing in life is power, not love. And power must be won on the battlefield of men against men. 
by attacking and denigrating the greatest virtue and power of women, which is love, feminism has corrupted the nature of too many women. And thus, it has sown and fertilized the ground for the demise, the disappearance of women. Today, transgender ideology makes countless girls believe that by mutilating their bodies to be men, they will be more fulfilled, happier, more immediately able to fulfill the male dreams, the macho dreams of radical feminism. And so, girls and women disappear. Because weakening and demeaning that which is most feminine, that which is most powerful in the feminine, can only contribute to the weakening and disappearance of women. Yet another way of disappearing women is the inclusion of transgender athletes in sporting competitions. Just as no person who was born a man will ever be a woman, because the chromosomes in each of our multi-trillion cells will never change, no matter how many surgeries and how many tons of hormones we consume, no athlete who was born a man will ever be a woman. Ah, but mediocre athletes who never managed to stand out among men are now great champions among women. Bravo! Give them a medal for their bravery. Feminism paved the way for this attack by insisting that men and women are equal, and even more, that women can do everything as well or better than men. Mm. Those who defend the notion that gender is fluid are interested in erasing the boundaries that define it, in displacing the two natural sexes and replacing them with an infinite catalog of new fluid gender options. They aim to destroy the order of nature, which has always favored and will continue to favor the male and female genders, because those two are the ones that work for the survival of any species. To see cheating, mediocre athletes competing and winning medals among women is an insult to women and to all of us. For major sporting associations and organizations to even consider for a minute the inclusion of these cheats in events and competitions is surely shameful and unjustifiable. There is a very funny meme out there on the internet which has a picture of a motorcyclist on his motorbike, surrounded by cyclists, and it says, Motorcyclist who now identifies a cyclist breaks cycling records. This is the kind of advantage a transgender man has when competing against women, and that's why it is ridiculous to think this charade will hold. We will never recognize these cheats as champions. It is not men who attack femininity. It is feminists by teaching women that their femininity is their weakness. Unfortunately, many women collaborate in their own destruction. And if one day soon science should achieve, imagine, reproduction without women, that would be the end of women and of civilization. Giving up what is natural, God-given and ordained, always has the most dire consequences. But the snake is so happy every time we walk into that trap. Countless schools in Europe and the USA are full of young people who cannot explain what a woman is or why anyone should even want to be a woman. A staggering number of high school-age girls now identify as trans or non-binary. Women's sports are in the gravest danger. The basic privacy and dignity of women and girls are completely trampled on when prisons, locker rooms, sporting showers, and women's bathrooms are open to everyone because that is what LGBTQAI groups demand. Women's wombs are rented out as if they were machines or factory farmed chickens. And the term woman is itself a questionable concept because transgenderism says it is discriminatory. Today, women, as we've seen, must be called menstruators, people with a cervix, people who give birth. 
and study after study shows that today's young men and women are more unhappy, more prone to depression and suicide than ever before. Oh, the snake is having a party, a field day. You know that the Brits, the Brit Awards, are the most significant event on the British music scene, the Grammys of Britain. With typical transgender self-regard and narcissism, singer Sam Smith complained a couple of years ago that he had been excluded from the Brits because neither the male nor the female category applied to him, because he likes to wear women's clothes and use gender-neutral pronouns. So, in 2022, to please Sam Smith and other transgender activists, the Brits abolished the Best Male Artist and Best Female Artist categories and merged them into one, a gender-neutral Best Artist category. And guess what? In 2023, women simply disappeared from the Brits. Not a single woman was nominated for that Best Artist Award. The shortlist of five finalists consisted of five male artists. In the year 2023 at the Brit Awards, women disappeared. Not only are women not on the list of five finalists, but they are underrepresented on the original long list, made up of 65 men and only 12 women. Was the Voting Academy saying no women deserve to be seriously considered for the Best Artist Award? This is another example of women being disadvantaged to the point of disappearing thanks to the pressures of gender ideology. So, we have already seen alarming evidence of the disappearance of women in the workplace, hospitals and maternity wards, schools, sports, and even in the arts. How ironic, isn't it? that 50% of the population is discriminated against and suppressed in the name of equality and inclusion demanded by LGBTQAI groups. I'm sure we've all played the mental game of imagining what the world would be like today if the Persians, the Jews, the Aztecs, the Incas, or the Nazis had triumphed. Imagine the hypersexualized but sterile world in which gender ideology wants us to live, where any unnatural whim is applauded despite its cost on life. Humanity would disappear in just two or three decades because it is heterosexual couples who reproduce and thereby contribute to the survival of the human species. Imagine any animal species that stops reproducing, that falls for the delusion that sexual activity is only for recreation and leisure. How long would such a species last? Just as long as it takes for the present generation to die out, because there will be no new generation to follow. We do not ever want to lose or exchange the life-giving, expansive, generous love of women for the sterile and narcissistic dreams of the transgender. With women, we build community, companionship, and life for the future. With transgenderism, what will we have? Loneliness, dissatisfaction, and the self-delusion of a generation that would not be able to sustain, much less generate life even to survive the present. We may already be too late to turn back. Every day we are witnesses and victims of an uncanny, disturbing drive to silence and erase one half of humans, and with it, of course, the whole of humanity, as the serpent has always wanted to take her revenge on God in the best of his creation. We must turn back. It's now or never. We all have a generous but often misguided impulse to be open and inclusive. But the great problem with being too open-minded is that our brains drain off our ears. We cannot allow fear to paralyze us 
when we realize the deception we have fallen victim to. We have to say, enough is enough, as the best Scots did in opposing and defeating Nicola Sturgeon. The fate of our schools, families, and civilization depends on it. As the poet John Milton suggested in Paradise Lost, destroying Eve is the serpent's perfect revenge on God. Only Satan would want to destroy Eve, and so destroy us all. Never tolerate nor participate in this destruction. Thank you for listening. I know it wasn't fun. My name is Gabriel Porras, and I am a philosopher, professional journalist, and voice artist. <laughs>